If you want to join the EU, you better recognize Kosovo. Germany sends that message to Serbia. But will Belgrade listen? I'm Imran Garta, and today's newsmaker is the 10-year anniversary of Kosovo's independence. Kosovo has a legitimacy problem, and the key to it is Serbia. The bad blood between the two countries far surpasses the last 10 years. So far, in fact, you have to go back to the 1400s, when Albanians sided with the invading Ottomans and the Serbians with Orthodox Russia. Those fault lines exist to this day, and Germany knows it, which is why its foreign minister stood in Pristina on Wednesday and called recognition of Kosovo a central pathway to the European Union. If Serbia gives in, the Russians and their allies are likely to follow. And how badly does Kosovo need that to happen? Well, Kosovo's Minister of European Integration will come on the program in just a moment. So let's see what she has to say. But first, let's get this report by Annelies Burgess. The joy and pride of becoming a nation were on display in the streets of Pristina when Kosovo declared independence from Serbia in 2008. Kosovars, young and old, felt their dream had finally materialized. Now we are a new state on the world map. Congratulations to Albanians. But 10 years on, the generation brought up in an independent Kosovo believes the country doesn't have much to show for itself. Young people are leaving in droves to look for a better future elsewhere. Kosovo's economy is floundering. The average annual salary amounts to around 5,000 US dollars, and unemployment is at 33%. Diplomatically, it's not where you want to be either. As many as 80 countries haven't recognized Kosovo's independence, and the nation has yet to be admitted as a member of the UN. So why has Kosovo had it so hard? The road to an independent Kosovo was marked by violence. After the breakup of Yugoslavia, Serbian forces under Slobodan Milosevic killed more than 13,000 mostly ethnic Albanians. The crisis was only resolved when NATO got involved. Two decades of tenuous coexistence ensued. But recently, the strain between Kosovo Albanians and Serbians has once again intensified and could be further fueled by yet another violent act. The murder of Oliver Ivanovic, a prominent Kosovo Serb leader, raised concerns of renewed tensions in the Western Balkans and prompted a Serbian delegation to cancel EU-sponsored talks with Kosovo in Brussels. Ostracized by its neighbors and antagonized by their allies, Kosovo has long looked at the West for support and promises to continue doing so. During an interview with TRT World's documentary program Crossing the Line, the man who declared Kosovo's independence 10 years ago spoke with optimism about the country's future. Kosovo has a long way to go before fulfilling its ambition of becoming a prosperous, sovereign country. Reconciliation and justice are crucial steps on the road to transform Kosovo into what its people have long dreamed of. Annelise Borges, 
the newsmakers. Well, I'm joined now from Pristina by the Kosovar Minister of European Integration, Durata Hoja. Thank you very much for being with us. Ten years on, you're an independent country. How much will it mean to you to be an independent country that is a member of the European Union? Well, um, right now we have many reasons to celebrate and to mark our 10th anniversary of our independence and uh, especially the new enlargement strategy that has been uh, published just last week uh, right on the eve of our uh, 10th anniversary. It shows the way forward uh, towards EU and of course uh, we are uh, committed to do all the homework that we need to do in order to advance as much as possible and as fast as possible towards the EU integration. Uh, EU is our only alternative and uh, we are all determined and it's all our vision to join European integration and uh, become a member of NATO. So Euro-Atlantic inter uh, integration is the vision that Kosovo pursues. Mm -hmm. Have there been any roadblocks recently, especially when you look at some of the tensions regarding the specialist chambers and parliament wanting to take away that court? Have you at any time worried that your relationship with the European Union would be damaged to the extent that it would damage your EU accession? Well, uh, as I mentioned, the EU enlargement strategy, uh, for the first time, uh, Kosovo is equal to the other Western Balkan countries. So the strategy mentions the integration and the enlargement perspective for the six Western Balkan countries including Kosovo. So for us, this is de facto recognition of all the EU members. On the other hand, though, uh, there are two other uh, very important uh, aspects of the enlargement strategy which foresee and also uh, pave the way for Kosovo to move forward on the uh, integration process. Uh, one is the dialogue and the full normalization between Republic of Kosovo and Republic of Serbia. So full normalization obviously for us, for Republic of Kosovo and many EU member states means uh, recognition, mutual recognition uh, of Republic of Kosovo and Republic of Serbia. And then the other very important uh, aspect of the strategy, the second pers uh, aspect is uh, the issue that EU has put very concretely, very specifically, in very specific language, that Kosovo and Serbia must reach a legally binding agreement which would uh, uh, implement uh, the dialogue. But on the other hand, though, it would enable, or I would better say it would disable the Western Balkans mm -hmm. to impede or hinder the integration process of one another. So basically, no Western Balkan countries would be able to stop another one joining. Ten years on, are you disappointed that this process... So we process enjoy excellent relations, certainly. to answer your question certainly. briefly. Certainly, yes. Ten years on, are you disappointed that it maybe took yep. so long to get to where you are right now and that you haven't really achieved a whole lot when it comes to international recognition? So there's slightly less than 80 countries that still don't recognize you. You don't have a seat at the UN. You're not members of the European Union. Ten years since independence, is that a bit of a disappointment? Uh, I wouldn't call it a disappointment. Kosovo uh, has a lot to, to mark, has a lot to celebrate the achievements so far. We have been recognized by 115 countries, which are the largest democracies, the largest world, eco world economies. We have uh, become member of uh, World Bank, uh, EBRD, uh, IMF, and many other international institutions. So for us, uh, the road is still ahead. So we see this as a progress, but then there's much more to do. And I would like to look at this from a more optimistic angle. If we look at where we were in 1999, obviously uh, a country devastated from war, a country devastated uh, all around destruction, plus the human tragedy, uh, attempted genocide, I would say that uh, we have achieved a lot. Kosovo is 10 years old, uh, of course, there's a lot more to do. But then on the other hand, though, another very uh, strong achievement, which I would say, is also the uh, signature of the Stabilization Association Agreement, mm -hmm. for, which for Kosovo is the first formal uh, agreement, the first 
uh, which formalizes the relationship between Kosovo and EU. So for us, it's the first stepping stone, and uh, we are well well ahead to uh, implement this agreement. Okay. Durata Hoja, I thank yep. you very much for joining us here on the Newsmakers. It was great to talk to you. Well, let's open up this discussion and go to Pristina again. We're joined by an advisor to the Speaker of the Kosovo Parliament, Adri Nurelari. In Belgrade, we have Slobodan Samadzija. He's a journalist and former editor for the Serbian newspaper Politica Daily. And in London is Tim Judah, who's written several books on the Balkans and is the Economist's correspondent in the region. I thank you all for joining us. Slobodan, let me begin with you. We have the German Foreign Minister Sigmar Gabriel saying Serbia must recognize Kosovo's independence as a condition of joining the European Union. Is that a fair request? Oh, well, German minister said something that is not acceptable for Serbia because uh, joining the EU, uh, EU is not a definite thing. We, all we got from the United uh, Euro, European is that we can join the family if we recognize Kosovo, but not that we will join European Union. So that promise is very, very weak and uh, nothing concrete. Uh, it's just a threat, nothing else. Adri, That's is it encouraging? My, my certainly. Opinion. Okay, Adri, is it encouraging to you that the Germans? seem to be laying down the gauntlet here for Serbia when it comes to recognizing Kosovo and accession to the EU. It is indeed very encouraging. And as we know, the European as I said, Union project uh, uh, started uh, as a project of uh, peacemaking and uh, creating a, an environment of interdependency where, all, where a possible conflict would be unthinkable among the countries that are members. And uh, knowing the fact that the EU goes by uh, learning from mistakes and... Uh, Considering the fact that in the past they've had new members like uh, Cyprus uh, or uh, uh, like uh, Croatia, Slovenia that have had problems with neighboring countries, then they've decided not to repeat some of those mistakes. So they're taking uh, precautions and asking for a criteria that uh, for Kosovo is uh, very welcome, which is the criteria of solve problems with the neighborhood before entering the EU. So, Tim, we have this fascinating. Uh, duality going on where we have the old enemies both sort of jostling for attention and both racing towards the European Union or trying to get towards the European Union and you have Serbia who won't recognize uh, Kosovo, Serbia and her allies, 10 years after Kosovo's independence. 10 years on, is Kosovo a fragile country, Tim? Well, I think it's uh, n not a fragile country. I think it's um, consolidated in uh, many respects. But, uh, you know, as a new country, it still has uh, plenty of problems. Um, and especially, it's not completely sovereign in all of its territory. I'm thinking especially of the Serbian inhabited north of Kosovo um, and the enclaves uh, where Serbs tend to live. Um, I think that a lot of progress has been made, agreements have been made, a lot of them haven't yet been implemented, but still there's been a, a lot of progress. Uh, but still, having said that, Kosovo is not, mm -hmm. Kosovo, the, the government of Kosovo's authority is not uh, complete over the whole uh, territory. But I, I mean, I wouldn't say it was, uh, I wouldn't over-exaggerate and say it was mm -hmm. that fragile, no. Yeah, okay, Slobodan, we've had Tim mention the north of Kosovo. Yes. I was recently in North Mitrovica, I thought to myself, well, if you think the Balkans are completely resolved, come to North Mitrovica, because clearly it was extremely tense and people there had their loyalty to Belgrade and not to Pristina. And so I, I wondered to myself, will there ever come a day where the ethnic Serbs there in North Mitrovica and in the rest of the enclaves would ever feel loyal to an identity as Kosovars? Will that ever happen, Slobodan? Well, it will happen the same day when people from Kosovo, Albanians, recognize Belgrade as their center and uh, where, where the government is. Because uh, until now, Kosovo is not separated 
country is not separated from Serbia. It is not an independent country. So all that we are talking about now is something that is in the, I would say, in the clouds. You know, you can never say, you can say uh, that this is definite or not definite. That is why I say that European Union is, uh, it's, uh, it's obligated to do something to, uh, to say, uh, to Albanians, the same th story that they say to Serbia, you must accept the reality. And the reality is that uh, the peace between Albanians and, and Serbs in the terms of, uh, you, uh, under the European term, ter terms is not acceptable because it is not, uh, it is not uh, uh, natural because these people are not in fight exactly. The fight was only uh, began when the European Union started to break Yugoslavia okay. so, and okay. so, Serbia. So what's interesting? Itself. Okay, so, so interesting. Slobodan, if, Slobodan has okay. mentioned you've given you've given a uh, a position which seems to be quite prevalent among many Serbs still to this day, even though Kosovo is ten years old and declared independence ten years ago. Adri, how do you feel about the fact that in Serbia? There are still many people who feel you should not exist as a country. You were just a province of Serbia. You should not have declared independence. You don't exist as a country. Anachronistic and outdated opinions because, as a matter of fact, Kosovo with Serbia is undergoing an EU-facilitated uh, dialogue that has resulted in numerous agreements that have, in a sense, normalized the relations in between uh, Serbia and Kosovo, and has provided de facto uh, recognition, considering the fact that uh, the highest authorities of Serbia have signed those agreement and they have implemented them as well. And those agreements have resulted in a lowering of, in, of the ethnic tensions and in the dismantling of the uh, parallel structures of Serbia in Kosovo. As a matter of fact, you mentioned earlier the northern Kosovo, but it's been two pairs of parliamentary elections in 2014 and 17, and as well as two pairs of local elections, 2013 and 17, where uh, the northern Kosovo a community of, of, of Serbs have participated and have been included in the institutions uh, of uh, uh, Kosovo. So not only the Serbs are not looking anymore at Belgrade, but they are part right. of the uh, government of, of Kosovo. And as a matter of fact, uh, we have been expanding in the last year, so we're moving in the right directions. Even the uh, judiciary systems, like last year, um, numerous policemen from uh, northern parallel structures have been involved and included in the uh, Kosovo Adrian, let me ask you, sorry to interrupt you. Sure, sir, let spirits. me ask you, after the killing of Oliver Ivanovic, a Serb politician in North Mitrovica, after he was gunned down, and we still don't know who gunned him down. People are blaming everyone. I mean, I've, I've spoken to Kosovo Albanians who blame Serbs. I've spoken to Serbs who blame Albanians. After that, I spoke to ethnic Serbs who, who basically felt that they are treated as if they don't belong in Kosovo, and they feel their security is under threat. Is that a myth? Is it just in their head? Or might there be something that you need to address as the government of Kosovo? You no, know, you're definitely right that that needs to be addressed, and we're moving in the right direction by uh, expanding the, uh, the governmental structures when it comes to the judiciary and the police of Kosovo. But uh, as you probably know, uh, Mr. Ivanovic uh, mentioned that he was more fearful of the Serbian community before his death than of the Albanian community. So it, le it looks that we moved mainly from an inter-ethnic uh, situation to an intra-ethnic situation. However, of course, more efforts should be done. But the good thing and the good news is that uh, uh, the northern part of Kosovo has been gradually been uh, integrated to the rest of the country in all uh, forms and, and branches of, of okay. government. Slobodan. And, uh, it okay. will be a matter of time. Okay, it's only a matter of time. Slobodan. Slobodan, that's good news. It's gradually being integrated into the rest of Kosovo. So whether you like it or not, this country is here to stay. And eventually, the north will be integrated. How do you feel about that? Well, I don't know. It's uh, everything is still on the table. Nothing is des decided yet. So we will see what will happen. But uh, you must know that uh, uh, I think that uh, the problem was made. All the problem was made by European Union, not by people in Serbia or, or people in Kosovo. And now, because they cannot resolve that problem, they now 
want us to resolve their problem. Mm -hmm. Because you see, uh, in Europe, there, there is, it is not just Kosovo. In Europe, there are many places where the similar situation is on the way. For instance, Catalonia in Spain. So uh, I don't think that it will be the end of all this. Tim Judah, let me bring you in here. Uh, because when I was in Pristina, spent a bit of time with President Hashim Thaci, I asked him about this process of dialogue with his Serbian uh, counterparts. And, you know, I asked him what he thought of what Serbia's foreign minister had said when he said that only a blind person can think that the problems in the Balkans are over. Have a little listen to, to what he said to me, and, and then I'll get your response after that. Но през декларацията нга зовен си Слободан Милшевич. Ай бе дъх момент на тоа логика на конфликтите и отмир коптиме да пач. Па марс не се му кам диалогувал ме тане Брюксел, пор оште не декларација сум бо пешти би да не одеше коментар, се пса оште тие калува. And in Brussels is he a different person to you compared to the one that makes statements like this? Complicated person. <laughs> it, def it depends from the situation. <laughs> so, so, Tim, you know, he's basically saying, well, you know, the Serb leadership says one thing in Brussels and they say another thing to their domestic audience. There didn't seem to be the greatest amount of trust, you know, when he, when he spoke of his Serb counterparts. Now, what does that tell you about, I guess, the political appetite moving forward? Is the political leadership in Kosovo and, and maybe also as well in Serbia, are they, are they really capable and willing to sorting this out long term? Well, I think that if there's political will, they're, they're capable of doing anything. But, uh, but uh, politicians from both sides are, of course, are bound by electoral timetables. And Serbia's got local elections coming up on March the 4th. And uh, the foreign minister of Serbia is um, campaigning for his party, just like um, other politicians do. So he will say things uh, because he has to get uh, votes uh, when he has to deal with the, with the Kosovo-Albanian leadership in, in, in Brussels. Uh, then then he will be uh, he will be he will be uh, be a, a much more pragmatic politician, right. I should think. Yeah. So, okay, domestic audience and international audience as well, and that's factored in. Adri, specialist chambers did that do some damage to your relationship with the West because Parliament wanted to remove the court that could see the leadership of Kosovo end up at the Hague. They wanted to remove it. Now, you know, it, it, there seems to have been a bit of sort of push and pull and uh, quid pro quo. And now that's kind of died down. But at the time, the U.S. ambassador, Greg Delawi, said there will be major consequences. And it seemed as if the West, the United States and the, and the Europeans were saying, hey, what's, what's going on with you, Kosovo? After everything we did for you, you guys now don't believe in our form of justice. You're OK with us trying Serbs, but you're not OK with us trying your own potential war criminals. Has that done damage to your relationship with the West? First, I, I want to add something to what you were speaking about earlier. Uh, Serbia has said that they would never, Belgrade has said they would never recognize Croatia. Uh, and uh, then years afterwards, they, they recognized Croatia uh, after like six or seven years uh, from, from the war. And then now they have uh, visits of the highest levels among two countries, regardless of the bitter past that they had among uh, each other. So I don't think this is an ultimate thing. I mean, I believe that the climate of opinion in Belgrade and in Serbia will change just like it changed uh, towards Croatia in the not-so-distant future. When it comes to your question, actually, I don't think that there was a will of the parliament. It was a, a petition uh, that was uh, initiated by the war veterans uh, uh, that uh, led to a movement of parliament to address it. So uh, it, it didn't go that far uh, as an advanced attempt to do it. Uh, when it comes to the potential uh, uh, project uh, that was initiated by the veterans to remove the chamber. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, I don't think that Kosovo will uh, do any harm to the strong relations that it has with the Western world and with the United States, European Union and other Western allies, because uh, in Kosovo there is a, a large and, and, and deep uh, sense of gratitude uh, towards uh, the assistance that was received in the past by these countries. And uh, in no way would anybody sort of try to harm that because right. it would have a major backlash when it comes to the votes. Uh, the thing is that Kosovo uh, is not like... I mean, there, there's a sort of resentment, a public resentment that exists among the people because uh, it is not like Kosovo has not collaborated with international justice. 
Uh, on the contrary, Kosovo uh, has been a, a collaborative fully when it comes to the International Hague Tribunal. Uh, it was run by an international court, actually. The United Nations uh, mission in Kosovo, UNMIC, had its own justice system here. And so went with the European uh, Union project here, ULEX. So uh, the only thing that people are, uh, you know, in a certain way uh, uh, feeling uncomfortable is that uh, there's a fatigue, because uh, it, this is basically the, the fourth uh, international court that will deal with the same things. And they feel a sense of double jeopardy, because the same issues are being rediscussed again in a new chamber. Nevertheless, uh, people believe here that uh, this is a bitter pill that we have to swallow in order to maintain the good relations with uh, the United States and the European Union. Mm -hmm. And we are willing to take the cost. But also we see this also as an opportunity, actually, to remove once and for all all the, uh, the stains uh, that they are trying to, uh, you know, uh, blame on, on, uh, on Kosovo and, um, and provide the maximum of transparency and remove any doubts when it comes to the fact that uh, our war, the Kosovo Liberation Army War, was a just one and it was done, uh, you know, uh, in accordance with international uh, laws and, and principles. Okay, well, it's 10 years old. It's still a young country. It's not even a teenager yet. It remains to be seen if all these knots can be untangled in the next 10 years and if Kosovo can get the international recognition across the board that it's so desires, but for the moment I've got to move on. So, Adri Nurelari, Tim Judah and Slobodan Samadzija, as well as Durata Hoja earlier on, I thank you all for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Well, on the latest episode of Crossing the Line, I went to Kosovo, as was mentioned, and met President Hashim Thaci and Prime Minister Ramush Haradinaj. You can check out those full interviews in our documentary on Saturday at 15.30 GMT, or right now by clicking over to trtworld.com. Coming up on the Newsmakers is a humanitarian crisis in eastern Congo, a tipping point for Central Africa. And Russia's ambassador to Turkey joins us on the show. I'll ask Alexei Yerkov if the Syrian war is still driving a wedge between the two countries. Conflict has been raging in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, killing dozens of people and forcing tens of thousands to escape to Uganda. Farmers and herders, rival ethnic groups, the army and other splinter factions are all involved. The Norwegian Refugee Council warns the sprawling violence, along with the country's many other conflicts, are adding up to a mega-crisis. Here's Natalie Pohonen. For these Congolese refugees, Lake Albert is a lifeline. They have had to leave their homes in the Democratic Republic of the Congo because of a rise in ethnic violence. We've seen the bodies of our brothers lying on the ground, people who were injured with machetes. Jack Bandinga has now joined the 34,000 Congolese who have fled to Uganda this year alone. It's a journey which has been repeated again and again. These people crossed into Burundi in January after fleeing clashes between DRC government forces and rebels. We came here because of the war problems. We fled the government army that kills, mistreats and rapes. We have come here and we don't know where to go. We are abandoned because of the war. The UN describes the situation in the DRC as one of the world's most complex, challenging, protracted and forgotten crises. There is fighting between armed groups and the army and intercommunal violence across a number of regions. 4.49 million people are internally displaced. More than 630,000 refugees have fled to neighboring countries. And the UN expects both of those figures to grow this year. The humanitarian crisis is being compounded by political uncertainty. President Joseph Kabila was meant to step down in December 2016. He is still in power. In recent months, pro-democracy protesters have taken to the streets of the capital, Kinshasa, calling for him to step down. Kabila has questioned their motives because elections are scheduled for the end of the year. Can you look at 
l'objectif ultime, c'est d'atteindre, c'est d'aller où Est-ce que c'est l'organisation des élections Je ne pense pas, parce que le calendrier est déjà là. And while the country waits for political change, ordinary Congolese will continue to suffer. Natalie Pohanen, The Newsmakers. Well, joining us now from Leicester in the UK is Michael Chibangu. He's the president of the Association for Development and Democracy in Congo. And in Washington, D.C., Mvemba Dizolele. He's the advocacy advisor at the Eastern Congo Initiative. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Michael, let me... Let me start with you. There's a lot of things to try and unpack when it comes to what's happening, particularly in the East. If there's one common denominator in terms of the problem right now, what would that be? Well, the central government in DRC is increasingly weak, unable to fulfill its duties, such as providing the security of uh, the population in the East and fulfilling all what the state should do. So we have a situation of lawlessness and uh, on top of that, you have uh, a lot, over 100 militias that are roaming in the east of Congo as a result of mm -hmm. the failing of the state. And uh, to make things worse, we have the political crisis as well. Okay, so Mvemba, would you agree with that, that because of the weak central government, you've got all these bitty conflicts that are adding up, they're creating a refugee crisis, and it's hard to even keep up with the fighting because you follow one and something else flares up elsewhere. One of it dies down and something else gets worse. Absolutely, I agree, but I want to clarify a couple things. Those are not ethnic conflict. These are mismanagement of the country, which has been compounded by the crisis of leadership on the part of uh, Kabila, his illegitimacy, his illegality, and his presidency is now unconstitutional. So we have a president who has no basis to rule the country, and that has compounded the problem. Right. So, Mvemba, when, when people report that we have hammer herders and Lendu farmers attacking each other, it seems to be ethnic conflict. Would you perhaps qualify that by saying ethnic tensions are being stoked as a result of weak leadership? Well, you know, my position is that nothing is ethnic. The Lendo and the Emmas who are fighting are Congolese. The fighting because their rights are being trampled upon, the fighting because there is a government that has been unable to, to impose the rule of law. So whatever issues that are setting those various communities are resolved. As a reporter in 2006, I was embedded with Moroccan troops in Bunia, where exactly those two communities that you're referring to live together. So the issues that they deal with are issue of rule of law and those issues are not being addressed. That's really the, the problem. The problem is not that the Hemas or Lendus. These are Congolese trying to get the issues resolved. Okay, that's and the government is absent. That's really good insight that you're giving us. Michael, would you concur with that? Yes, I absolutely agree, which is why I say that uh, the central government is weak. So over the past 17 years, we had a very weak lead leader, Joseph Kabila, who came into power, but unfortunately, has failed to provide security for the people, has failed to uh, build up an army that can actually take care of, of the situation. Not very long ago, we had a crisis in this central DRC, in provinces of Kassar, where thousands of people, again, were killed and others had to flee. And all this point to a weak leadership in Kinshasa, uh, where the President Kabila, as uh, it has been mentioned, no longer has legitimacy, is uh, out of his mind. His mind that ended in... Uh, 2006, but he's still in power. This is causing a lot of tension, and this tension is again driving the country down. The crisis in DRC is actually getting worse as Kabila trying to cling right. and hang on to power. Right. right, and and uh, and I must note that we did try very hard to get somebody who is either a representative of the government of DRC or a supporter of President Kabila. We couldn't get them on the program. Vemba, let me ask you about the incident regarding the Rwandan troops as well. So we have the Congolese army initially thinking that it was fighting X M23 militia members. And then they realized, oh no, we're actually engaging with the Rwandan army itself. And both sides sort of backed down. Did you, like everybody else, think, what the hell is going on? Is this going to flare up into full-blown war? Not at all. Um, this is something that has happened often. 
Uh, you know, of course, that Rwanda has been involved in Congo since 1994. And um, the government of Rwanda has not been transparent in its engagement in DRC. And, but also, as we study this program, um, the problem is also the government of DRC itself is not transparent and its engagement in that region. So it's very difficult to sort out what exactly happened mm -hmm. and who is uh, driving uh, those friction that you just mentioned, Imran. Right. Michael, for those who have fears that this might get much worse and become very similar to the worst of the worst, as we saw in the mid-1990s, do they have cause for concern? I wouldn't say that they have cause for concern. As we, we know, these, these are things that actually happen quite a lot, quite frequently in, in DRC, because also there are border demarcation issues around the, around the, the border between uh, DRC and, and Rwanda. There's also mismanagement. Sometimes you would have a, a Congolese troop going in Rwanda and Rwanda troop crossing the border. So there's a lot of things that, uh, as I said, point out to a government that is very weak and able to do what it should do, and they have chaos, actually, uh, in the east of DRC. So in, not only in the east, you mentioned the, the conflict in Uteri, but there's an ongoing war as well against other militia group, mm -hmm. which is causing thousands of people to leave. So that area, of the, that part of the country is is mismanaged. Is mismanaged. And as a, as a result, there's all sorts of things going on. But I wouldn't say that we will see a full blown out war between uh, Rwanda and, uh, and Uganda, unless the government want to use that as an opportunity to delay the election further. Yeah, and, and you both seem to be in agreement that Kinshasa doesn't really have any control, any effective control on the east of the country. The east of the country does seem to be tremendously ungovernable, unmanageable. As you mentioned, loads of militias there. Remember, you mentioned that you were among Moroccan peacekeepers in the past while you were reporting. There are other UN peacekeepers at the moment in the eastern DRC. Why aren't they able to do anything? And this is exactly part of the problem, Imran. You know, the UN has its largest peacekeeping mission in the world in DRC, and most of them are stationed in eastern Congo. The UN has become part of the problem because the UN has been inadequately funded, but also the UN lacks the political will to carry out the Chapter 7 mandate that it has, which is the mandate to protect civilians. This problem is made has been worsened by the weakness of the Kinshasa government, because in reality, the Kinshasa government should have worked closely with the UN, giving them directions in where the help is much needed. Because the government is absent, because the president is inept, and because it's illegal and unconstitutional, he cannot face the UN and demand that they perform their duty. But then the international community is kind of left uh, as a default solution, which Again, there is a lack of political will and uh, the population suffers. Michael, is the UN toothless in the east of the country? Unfortunately, the UN is toothless. They've been there for the past 19 years or so, but they've not really done anything. As I mentioned, there's over 100 militia groups that are actually roaming freely, causing cause, killing people, looting the country. And the, the, even when the mandate of the UN was changed, because a special regret was created, with an, an offensive mandate to actually go out and design militia. But we've not seen anything. All we saw was when the M23 war started, the, 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 initiate, or the, the, the initiate attack. But since then, they've not really done much. And the, the militias are actually increasing, and, and we see more people are fleeing. So this is a crisis that is actually getting worse, and they're not doing what they're supposed to do, unfortunately. Yeah, and Vemba, you, we've had... The, the man who was formerly at the UN, now at the Norwegian Refugee Council, Jan Egeland, putting out a desperate appeal in terms of the humanitarian situation because we're seeing millions of people displaced, hundreds of thousands on the move on a weekly basis. It's a terrible humanitarian crisis. They're calling for aid. They're saying the situation is bad. Does that encourage you, at least in the sense that it might actually make people wake up in the international community and there might be some political will to do something about the root causes of what's happening? Not at all, not at all, Imran. I think that is the problem. The problem is that the international community, whatever that is, treats Congo as a humanitarian crisis. And that's what they've done for the last 20 years. The crisis in Congo, while it has humanitarian ramification, is a political crisis. 
we need to tackle the political crisis, and the political crisis is fueled by the weakness and the unconstitutionality of the Kabila government. So un unless and until the international community confronts Kabila and pushes him out, this will continue. And I have to say that the Congolese are very dismayed by this weak uh, response of the international community that continue to hide behind the international, uh, be, excuse me, behind the uh, humanitarian crisis. Right. This is a political crisis that has been long in the making, okay. and we need to tackle it. Michael, do you agree with that, that the world treats Congo like it was hit by a natural disaster and that this wasn't, this didn't have its roots in a political crisis? Yes, it's, 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 a, it's primarily a crisis of leadership where we have the leader who's been in power for so long, so prolonged in power, but unfortunately has not been able to build up a country as he should have, as he should have done, has not been able to put build up an army that can actually protect the people. What we see is that even the army has now become part of the problem, where they commit crimes and atrocity. When you will see in Congo, whenever they deploy the army, it is always followed by an increase of crime increase of rape against the population. So the population are there defenseless. Who, can, who is going to protect them? So this is a problem that needs to be resolved from the roots. And the root is a leadership problem. A, a leader had, that has failed, mm -hmm. a leader that is now illegitimate. And because of that illegitimacy, the crisis is actually getting worse. We see the crisis spreading geographically from the east now to the center. And now we see killing in Tinshasa, in the capital, which is in, in, in the west of the country. The situation is that it's getting worse because of this leadership problem. Yeah, multiple strands of trouble in Democratic Republic of Congo. Gentlemen, I think it was important to talk to both of you to help us unpack some of it and demystify some of it. Michael Shibangu and Mvemba Dizolele, I thank you very much for joining us here on The Newsmakers. Our joint work tells us that Russian-Turkish relations are becoming special, have a special status, and are recovering fully. Relations between Russia and Turkey are on the rebound after sinking to a profound low. It happened a little over a year ago when Moscow's envoy to Ankara was assassinated. Andrei Karlov was shot and killed by a Turkish member of his security detail during an art exhibit in the capital. It happened at a time when tensions between the two countries were already high over Syria. Well, Karlov's successor joins me now from Ankara, Ambassador Alexei Yerkov. Thank you very much for joining me, sir. Relations between the two countries have had their ups and downs over the past few years, a down jet, an assassination of an ambassador in Ankara. But things seem to be in a good place right now. Are they better than ever when it comes to Turkey and Russia right now? Good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad, uh, let me say, I'm very glad to, to be here tonight with uh, TRT spectators. You know, the Russian-Turkish relations are feel extremely well the, these days. We are really on the same page, as uh, some say, on the same page. We have always been on the same page uh, because we are, our countries are were, are, and will be neighbors. Neighbors uh, who, uh, who deal with each other. Neighbors who trade with each other. Neighbors who even help each other. And uh, of course, we had during our, during the three centuries of our uh, relations, the 17th century, the 18th century, the 19th century, the, uh, someone calc made a calculation that uh, there was 12 big wars between our countries, not speaking of smaller conflicts. But at the same time, we had good moments of our cooperation throughout all these centuries. Let us remember 1833, when uh, an army sent by the Tsar, Tsar Nicholas I, saved uh, the empire from the, uh, from the troops of uh, uh, Egyptian Pasha Mohammed Ali. Uh, the, uh, the troops were standing in the Izmir region, and only the presence of Russian troops has saved mm -hmm. the empire. In 1920, 1921, the young Turkish Republic has requested uh, assistance from the young Soviet Republic, and the assistance was rendered because... Uh, Almost half of, uh, of the arms used by the Turkish army 
were provided by the Soviet Republic. So in 1921, the Treaty of Friendship and Brotherhood was signed between uh, Russia and Turkey, the treaty which gave Turkey such reasons as, as Kars, Artvin, Ardagan, and others. And now we're definitely on the same uh, page of uh, contemporary politics, economy, and international relations. We have really achieved something in this precise period of time. Late last year, 2017, we have, we have had a record number of meetings of our leaders, President Putin and President Erdogan, as well as a record number of their telephone conversations. This year, we have already had three telephone conversations between Mr. Putin and Mr. Erdogan, and we are going to have their meeting face-to-face -face, uh, very soon in Istanbul. Right. So, so, so if you don't trade, mind, I want to talk, if, if you don't mind, and, and my apologies results. for interrupting uh, you. In, I sincerely apologize yeah, for interrupting you. Uh, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but yes, looking please. forward, you mentioned Istanbul. Tell me why you think Russia and Turkey, in addition... Uh, to Iran, I guess, need to drive this process in bringing about peace in Syria when they have that meeting in Istanbul, and why this should be done between the likes of Russia and Turkey and not the West? Well, well let us speak about Syria. The issue is a very big one, a very complicated one, but anyway, uh, when I say we have achieved something together with Turkey. I mean something including what we have achieved in, uh, in Syria. Last year, Russia, Turkey, and Iran, we started what we call the Astana process, meaning the process of bringing peace to Syria through the four established de-escalation zones. And then through the process of... Uh, um, of hard and difficult uh, political negotiations which were start and which will be continued in Geneva under the UN auspices. So it is very important that uh, after having achieved uh, these de-escalation de zones, having um, guaranteed the, the uh, access of humanitarian uh, reliefs and aid to these uh, zones of uh, former confrontation. It is very important that we together try to move forward the process of political settlement of the Syrian crisis. And the, you know that uh, we have already uh, um, managed to, to convene a, a Congress in Sochi. Uh, came who came, but the results are evident. The documents which were adopted at the Congress, will now be delivered to Mr. Demistura, the UN Special Envoy, to be used uh, in Geneva, in Geneva talks for the uh, international, um, international uh, efforts uh, which, um, which are aimed at uh, the constitutional process in Syria, at the electoral process in Syria, and uh, at the end, at the uh, end of the uh, fratricide conflict, uh, which uh, this uh, this country right. witnesses uh, for many years now. Ambassador Yerkov, so you say the West? Yes. Yes. Well, uh, yes. I was, yes, I was just yes, going to ask you. To, I was going to ask you. Tell me why you should do this yes, and you, not the West. Tell me. You know, we started the Astana process, the three of us, Russia, Turkey, and Iran. And we have, we have achieved something. And we did not want, to, didn't want to, to be closed, for this process to be closed and uh, to be uh, prohibited for anyone. You know, we invited uh, all the others uh, who wished to participate in such a, the P5, uh, some regional, uh, regional uh, players. Some of them did, some of them didn't want to come. But anyway, we are not, uh, we are not closing the process. Uh, the Geneva negotiations 
the Geneva negotiations um, are meant to be uh, to be uh, just a complex uh, to have there a complex of participants, including the West. What you call. And if we start something without the West, without the West, well, I don't think it's. Uh, that means that uh, it is a, it is equal to non-success. Right. Anyway, uh, I can remind you that uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk started the national, uh, the national liberation movement uh, in Turkey without much help from the West, and uh, then he succeeded. Right. So uh, the West is welcome, but uh, we are also capable of doing something, the right. three of us. Let me ask you about Russian foreign policy in general. Any, For those... any more questions? Yes. For those who have... Yes, please. ...a nervousness about Russian foreign policy. Yes, they see Russia being more expansionist uh, under President Putin. They feel that Russia wants to gain a foothold in the Middle East by supporting Bashar al-Assad in Syria, by giving the West a bloody nose, if you like, and they see Russian expansionism in Ukraine, in the Baltics, and so on. For those who have a nervousness that Russia is becoming more aggressive through the Middle East, through the Caucasus and beyond, as an ambassador to Turkey and an ambassador to the world, what's your response to them? Well, you know, the, uh, our foreign policy is uh, guided by, uh, by some normative documents which were adopted. Uh, in particular, uh, you know, we have a foreign policy concept approved by the president two years ago. And uh, so I can say to you the main goals of the Russian foreign policy as set forth in the document, they are, first of all, to ensure the security national security, the national sovereignty, and the territorial integrity of Russia, and to ensure the well-being, uh, the prosperity, and uh, the um, sustainable development of the Russian economy. So uh, for those who are scared, for those who are, uh, expect that Russia is going uh, to swallow them, as some put it sometimes, I can, uh, I can say uh, only that Russia is uh, not going to swallow or to eat anyone. Yeah. Russia has enough food. By the way, we, <laughs> at, the, at the times of the Soviet Union, we, uh, we really lacked uh, some grain, some agriculture products, and we were buying them uh, at, the, at the world market. Now Russia is uh, completely self-sufficient in these products, and we even sell them. So we have enough food. We have enough territory. The, uh, it, the territory of Russia is more than 17 million square kilometers. We don't need anyone's territory. We have enough resources. So we are not going to invade anyone. What we seek is our own security. What we seek is our own stability. And what we seek is our uh, sustainable development. So this is, uh, this is concerned uh, what we call the near abroad, meaning the zones which are in the proximity of the state borders of the Russian Federation. It implies also to the Middle East, that implies to the other regions of the world. We are not playing the zero-sum games anymore. What we want and what, uh, what we search for is uh, uh, the, our security, our stability, and the realization of our deep national interests. That's more or less what I can tell you. Ambassador Alexei Yerkov, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us on the Newsmakers. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. You can check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Remember to like, follow and subscribe. Until then, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.